Welcome to the Business Mechanics Show. I'm your host, Vaughn Sigmund, co-founder of Results Driven Leadership. If you're looking for a way to take your career and business success up a notch, look no further. We can provide advice and tips from experienced executives who have seen it all before. Our real executives aren't trained trainers. Our training and coaching comes directly from experience, not out of some training manual. So explore rdltraining.com today and power up your professional drive with valuable knowledge, skills, and tools to make it big. No matter if you're getting started or have been leading a company for decades, all of our tools work. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of making your career and business more successful. I've got a favorite topic today, and I know I say that a lot because I've got a lot of favorites, but today I want to share with you the seven ways managers can create improved focus for their team. So let's talk about this. It's no surprise that people, your people and you as an individual may or likely struggle to focus. Because listen, we're bombarded with distractions burdened by maybe unrealistic expectations, self-imposed sometimes. And sometimes you feel like you're drowning under way too many requests. And in a world of constant distractions, many managers, many employees struggle and can't find the focus to get quality work done. In fact, I just, what prompted this, I saw a, a recent survey that showed that almost two thirds of, I think it was 1600 employees that were surveyed, two thirds admit that they don't put in an hour or two each day without being derailed. Think about that. They cannot work uninterrupted for more than an hour or two each day without being taken off course. And I see it all the time. So as leaders, let's think about and discuss today how, how you can help your team stay more productive, more focused. Results-driven leadership has identified seven best practices for helping people be much more intentional with their time. So let's talk about these and give them a try. So here's an example. I think many of you can relate to that. And I'm just going to make up some names here, but here's a common scenario. Stan. Mr. Stan, he's a busy manager. He has big plans for the day. He's determined to finish off a project proposal or a project and send it over to Audrey, his boss. But before Stan could even step foot into the office, Jane shows up and throws a curveball at him, asking for input on Q3 projections. And knowing that, hey, this will only take a few minutes, Stan agrees. Stan agrees, but what seems like seconds in his mind to get this done turned into 45 minutes. And to make matters worse, when Stan finally got settled into work, he got that out of the way, he finally settled it into work that morning, emails. Oh my God, the emails. They suddenly became oh so pressing. And despite being overwhelmed with all these demands from angles throughout the day, he started plowing through. Because he knows that with each completed task, he, he gives him some grateful relief amongst all, amidst all this stressful time that he's getting something done. But it may not be the most important thing to get done. See, Stan's been caught in the way where time is controlling him. He's not controlling his time. Because he started the day with enthusiasm, with eagerness. He had, a, he had a, a, an internal plan. 
he's going to get that project proposal done. And he was determined to finish that proposal before lunchtime. He just knew he could do that. But then James shows up. Later on, Susie shows up. And he wants to, and she wants to chat with Stan. And then that pushes back his plans even more. Then came the real unexpected. After lunch, the CEO calls for another working session that will completely disrupt Stan's time. His routine is out the window. And these disruptions in his routine during the whole day, chasing little tasks here and chasing little tasks there, such as the emails and the chats and the favors for me, including that one large request right after lunch to attend a meeting. And it wasn't until the end of this whole hullabaloo that reality hit him hard. The important task, that project proposal, that he was determined, he was convinced he was going to get done that day, still untouched. Not to mention missing out on his son's baseball game, which only made matters worse. Can any of you relate to this kind of scenario? I'm betting you can. It's the reason why you're listening to this podcast. Everyday distractions are taking their toll on you and your people. With so much going on, they're exhausted. You may be exhausted. And believe me, you've got people on your team in today's world with all this stress, this lack of ability to stay focused and get their highly important, what I call platinum activities accomplished. They're starting to feel disengaged. They're disengaged from the task at hand because they look around and say, Has there, have I really made any progress around here or am I just staying busy all the time? People love to accomplish things. But if we do not have the seven best practices pretty well dialed in in your organization I'm going to talk about today, I don't think you're going to be making a whole lot of progress. And it's, you know, ultimately it's hard to say if anyone's truly being productive or just being busy all day long. You cannot mistake busyness for accomplishment as the old saying goes. So as a leader, you're the boss. You had the power to create an environment where your team can stay productive and focus in spite of all this hyper stimulated world we live in. And to help you do this, I'm going to talk about these seven best practices today to improve focus, but also take a look at our productive time management course, which is all part of results driven management training. Through that, you'll understand how to give your team permission to limit distractions, saying no to low priority work, blocking out the noise, so they can focus on what's most important. Setting clear goals with achievable deadlines for their tasks and their projects. And if you're interested, if you're interested in this kind of course or any of our results driven management training, click on the link in the show notes and you can begin your training right away for only $47 per month, no contract, no commitment. Go check it out. Let's get into the seven best practices, the habits that need to be formed to allow your team to create improved focus. Best practice numero uno. You need to take a constant inventory of tasks and projects. What does that mean? Glad you asked. You see, having a clear understanding of all the tasks, all the projects on your plate is essential 
for successful prioritization. Because very often people take a partial task or just the priorities and prioritize those and don't take into account all the other distractions that you know are going to come. And as an effective leader, it's really important for you to encourage your team members to maintain up to do a up to date to do list of their commitments and duties, whether it's a daily routine, a daily expectation, and then all the other things that they've got to get committed to. You got to give them ample opportunity each week to take the time, plan, reflect on what needs attention first, second, third, but don't forget to build in the distractions because they're guaranteed to show up. Guaranteed. And I'm going to talk about some other ways to make sure that you can build in the right approach to this. But it's got to go beyond a to-do list. You need to help, constantly help, updating, prioritizing, discussing, reprioritizing, not only your task, but their task, their commitments. I mean, the only constant is change, right? And if you're in a fast growing organization, with lots of things going on, there's going to be curveballs coming all the time. And with those curveballs, high priority tasks are going to start moving down the list, keep moving down, run the risk of being forgotten, certainly delayed to the point where you're missing deadlines. So you need to help your team by first creating these habits yourself, but then leading the way and having a regular check-in to make sure you and they are on the same page. It could be your five-minute stand-up meeting in the morning. The old saying is, you don't know what you don't know. Well, that comes in right here. If you don't ask and are just assuming that you and them are on the same page about what needs to get done today, you're running a huge risk of being misprioritized, missing deadlines, being embarrassed. So you need to set the example by walking the talk yourself and set up the habit of regular check-ins. It could be daily. It could be a couple times a week. So, and you know what? I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this in the show notes too. It's a really good tool. It's free to you. Download the Results Driven Leadership Guide to Creating Successful Action Plans. It's a, about an 18-page guide. It takes you through the three most important steps to getting stuff done, creating action plans, how to manage those action plans through completion. Again, click on the link in the show notes, download it. It's free to you. Let me know what you think. Moving on to number two. Number two, best practice on how managers can create improved focus. You need to clarify and curate communication channels. In, let me be clear on this. In the average workplace, there's, a, there's become a lot of communication channels. And in fact, sometimes I believe there's just too darn many of them. Between email, text, phone calls, meetings, Slack, DMing, Monday, all these different tools that we're using. You have got to clear this up as a leader in your organization. You've got to reduce this burden. And you need to make it very clear. Everyone knows what each channel specifically is used for. And I also see this often. Everybody needs to understand how quickly, based on the channel, they should receive a response. 
because very often the person asking for the response has a timeline or a need or a sense of urgency around getting the response. The person being requested from may have a plate full of stuff to get done and that's way down their list. That creates this infighting, this frustration, miscommunication, bad expectations for each other. So you've got to help your team work together. Collaborate with them. Create the environment that supports effective working habits by clarifying when should you email a request? When should you get up and walk down the hall or across the floor and actually talk to somebody? When should you use Slack or a DM? Think about all the different ways that we're communicating with each other. And most importantly, set some guidelines for how quickly we should be responding to each other. These are highly effective work habits. You got to create that environment. Number three. This one's going to be a little controversial to some of you. I don't, some people's self-esteem or sense of urgency or demanding control qualities to their personality may struggle with this one, but I'm going to list it in here either way. Normalize that it's okay to say no. There's a lot of people, very much like myself, that are people pleasers. They're pleasers. And they want to do whatever they can to please their boss, their peers, their direct reports, and they have a real hard time saying no. So again, as a leader, it's important, essential, that you create the culture, the expectation where everyone feels safe expressing their worries about work overload and burnout. It's real. It's common. It's out there all the time. And let's not stick our heads in the sand and ignore it. It's a real thing. And you need to be okay with your team members saying no or explaining to you that it's not no, it's not right now because of all these other things I've got to get done. Because bosses are notorious for keeping laying things on people's plate, laying, laying, laying. Well, they don't see that plate. They don't see how full that plate is. The only person that realizes is the person that's receiving all these to-dos. And very often, they just keep their mouth shut, keep their head down, and keep piling it up. And they want to please you. They want to do a good job. But often they can't because it's not only you that's giving them things to do. It may be their direct reports that are requesting things. It could be a peer that's requesting things. You do not have a clear picture of everything that's on their plate. So you've got to encourage. You've got to be okay. Park your self-esteem. Park your ego, friends. And encourage your employees to speak up. Say their mind. Make it safe. To say no. And this, and many leaders are going to shy away from hearing this. They just want everything done, especially you high D's on the disc scale. This is like stomping on your toe and breaking a bone. But it's a killer to morale. And very often, you're punishing. Get this, get this, folks. Very often, you're establishing a workload that punishes your best people because you know they can get it done. And so when you've got something to get done, you look around and say, that, uh, you know, Susie gets it all done. And so more than Susie's fair share goes onto her plate as from a delegation standpoint, an assignment standpoint from you. And poor Susie, 
She just lets it pile up and pile up and you know, she's working nights and she's working weekends and her significant other is, is complaining. We'd never do anything together. They're like Stan in the earlier story, you know, they're missing key family moments because they're serving you and don't want to say no to you. you I know you don't want to create that atmosphere or expectation. So make it okay. Make it an open, collaborative environment, safe, that your folks can say no and explain why. Because you know, rather than ignoring these concerns, you got to teach your team how best to respond. And thank these people. Thank them for being honest and open so that you now understand and can reassign or reprioritize accordingly. Don't just ignore it, sweep it under the rugs again. You don't know what you don't know. And I'm telling you, so often I see this. And we're overloading, especially our best people, and those are the ones you don't want burnout, getting frustrated, and leaving you. Bad stuff. So don't sweep it under the rug and ignore it. Face it, that's an elephant. Embrace that elephant and do something about it. And let's just be realistic and allow your team to say no and explain why that's okay. But please don't be defensive and fight them over it. I'll get off my high horse there. Number four, you have to make your meetings meaningful. You have to establish standards for meetings. I'm telling you, constantly people are in meetings. You may not know it, especially if you're the one facilitating this meeting. People are in meetings that they're sitting there and saying, God, I wish I could have this hour back. I've got so much to do. Why am I sitting in this meeting? Why was I required here? I got stuff to do and I ain't getting anything done in here. Because they're talking about something that's completely not important to me. It doesn't involve me. So you've got to establish some best practices and habits, some standards for making sure your meetings are meaningful and worthwhile. And by doing so, you're showing respect for other people's time. Whether you're the boss and you're bringing your direct reports, or you're the boss's boss and you're bringing in direct reports and some of their direct reports. Don't just take what I call an efficient approach. It's very efficient just to get everybody into the room just in case and go through the meeting. So just in case somebody needs to know it, they heard it in this meeting. Don't mistake efficient with effective. You need to you need to create effective meeting standards. And you need to give your direct reports, your employees, your team members permission to turn down invitations. If, if they don't, if you don't set a clear defined purpose for this meeting that includes their area of expertise or responsibility, they need to be able to say no. They need to be able to turn that down. An effective manager, as we all know, sets an example by doing this, first of all, with yourself. So if you're not really good at making your meetings meaningful and effective, start with yourself. Set the example. And this, in turn, will allow your meetings to be much more productive, much more will get done. Your team will have greater control over their days, their time, so that now you can give them back some time to focus on more important tasks. And if someone invites you to a meeting without a clear agenda or a reason why you have to be there, you have to be, you have to be there because you're important to the vital success of this meeting, let everybody just decline it. Say no. 
value your time. If you don't manage them, your time will manage you. As a leader, put the onus back on the meeting creator, who again may be yourself, to show greater respect for others' time. And also, it's going to let your employees control their days so that they can get focused on their high priority work. Number five, enable purposeful productivity. And that's all nice, pretty words for, let's make sure we establish some GSD time or get stuff done. I'm going to keep it clean. You could insert another word there. But during your weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings, don't just ask if your employees are getting things done. Dig into the details of it. Discover how you can help them. Help them maximize their productivity. You're there to coach them. Don't just treat it as a task. Treat it as an opportunity to help them learn. Ask questions about their workload, their task, how they're approaching, who they're including. See if there's anything standing in their way. Man, is that important as a leader. If they've got any rocks in the way, you need to move them. And one of their boulders in the road may be a long list of priorities and other and extra requests that's pulling their attention away from a more important task or assignment. So then provide support to tackle those roadblocks head on. And how do you do that? You got a time block. You need to help them be more strategic with their time by creating calendar time blocks. Help them break down the elephant into bites so that they can work on it over time. These high priority, high priority, low urgency, long-term tasks, help them break that down into their most productive time of the day, for an hour or two a day. Block it like a doctor's appointment on their calendar so that they keep themselves tunnel visioned on this. But time blocking on the calendar is one of the single most effective tools. Anyone, anyone, and I've used this for years, folks. Used it for years, and man, does it, am I perfect? No. But I am so much better with managing my day. So strategic time blocking on the calendar. You can make adjustments. I mean, again, things are going to happen. You know, curveballs are going to come. But if I've already got it on my calendar, I can move it to another day or time, another time in the day or another day in time. But it doesn't fall off. It stays visual. It's always in my purview. And that way these things are always being made progress on and not getting crunched in the end to make up for lost time. Number six, formalize focus. This is almost a little bit like, well, no, kind of is, but it's, a, it's an addition to number five, which this is formalized focus. You need to establish a team norm. As part of your culture, a team norm of protected work time. Work time that can be efficient ways to promote focus. For example, schedule two days each week for uninterrupted GSD time. Get stuff done time. Those are everybody knows that those two hours on those two days are not they're not going to be interrupted, and that allows everyone on the team to get their tax done without disruption. They have that to look forward to, they can plan for it, they know they've got that downtime of all the other BS and disruptions. They're going to avoid all the obstacles that come their way during that period of time. 
and make sure, boss, that you honor these blocks. <laughs> you got to honor these blocks and refrain from scheduling over them. You know who I'm talking to. Otherwise, you cannot say you're going to do something and then a month or two later, throw it later, throw it out the window and just step all over it because you're going to crush morale. Let me tell you, in the companies that established this, two days a week, a couple hours, that nothing else happens than getting stuff done time, highly motivated people in that organization. If you start stepping on it, scheduling over it, interrupting it, ignoring the rule that you made, well, you're undermining your, yourself as a leader and your morale is going to start dipping. So be really careful with that. But let me tell you, it's one of the best tools outside of time blocking on the calendar. It's one of the best things you can do to help your team stay focused. And here's number seven. And it's one that when I conduct time management seminars, that a lot of people, they look at me and they say, oh, I've never thought about it like that. And that is number seven, create a to don't list. You got a to do list. You need a to don't list. You've got to be able to establish, understand essentials and boundaries they can always be honored. Cultivate an environment where focus work isn't just encouraged, but respected. Setting yourself as an example. Lead by showing that protected time is the real thing. Show your peers, your boss, your direct reports that protected time is nothing less than a reality. But there's also a bunch of things you can't be doing. This, you've got to understand, these are the things we're not going to do or you personally aren't going to do. So let me just give you some examples of the to don't list. And this is for you personally and help your team understand this too. Give them permission on some of these to don't list items. Don't multitask. It is, there's only about I don't know. It's less than 5% of the population that can truly multitask. The vast majority of people are incapable of multitasking. And that includes being able to pick up and put down, pick up and put down, start something, put it down, start something else, put it down, start something else, put it down, come back to the first thing, start it again. There's very few people who can operate that. Way. They need routine. They need to be able to start something and finish something. They need an organized work environment. So multitasking is the anti-productivity demon. And it also increases the chance of errors. It creates a lack of focus or a loss of focus. So don't expect either yourself, your teammates, to multitask. It's impossible. Number two, this is going to resonate with many of you. Don't procrastinate. Avoid putting off tasks until the last minute. You know you do it. And again, back to time blocking, looking at your high priority, low urgency items and breaking it down into little bites, get a, a little parts of it done an hour or two at a time. That will lead to the completion on time without having to work all weekend to get it done. Don't procrastinate. You're only screwing yourself when you do that. And when you're screwing yourself like that, you're increasing stress. You're lowering your quality of work. And you're also disengaging yourself or forcing others to disengage because you're expecting them to get things done in not the right amount of time. And you're not encouraging them to manage their time instead of their time managing you. Another real crucial one. A lot of people scratch their heads on this one because it's very addicting. And again, it's back to that, man, I got stuff done. It's that sense of accomplishment is don't check 
email or social media. Don't check email or social media too frequently. Constantly checking your email is just a damn distraction. It's another interruption, especially during your GSD time. If you got a big project to get done, you got to make it a self-directed rule that when I come in, the phone's off, email's off, I'm not going to do anything but focus on the task at hand. I'm not going to allow myself to get sucked in to checking emails, social media, etc. It's addicting. It just take me five minutes. I'll get this knocked out real quick. Oh, this will just take a sec. Oh, I probably ought to get this taken care of right away. And next thing you know, an hour or two is going by. And this big thing you came in to get done, first thing so that, man, I feel good about my day is going right out the window. Watch the emails. It's never in all the years that email's been around. I've been a part of that. Never has me delaying the response to an email for an hour or two got me in trouble. It just isn't. It's not going to get you in trouble. If you put it off for an hour, your response for an hour, responding for an hour, whether you're in sales, operations, finance, whatever it is, you come in to get something done, do not look at your email. It's the worst habit you can have. And don't constantly be checking email throughout the course of the day. Establish a time, X amount of time in the morning, X amount of time right after lunch, X amount of time before you go home, and that's the time you check email. And now, going back to a previous best practice, everybody needs to know, if you want a response from me right away, don't email me. Don't email me. You can text me, you can Slack me, that I'll, I'll get right back to you on Slack or text, because I'll know that's a 911. But you also let people know if they're abusing the 911 clause, to clean that up, you needed to email that. So, again, I'll get off my horse on that one. But email is not your friend when it comes to focusing on your work. Now, this one sounds... Uh, maybe a little, little fruits and nuts, especially to you high D's that are, are hardworking, sense of urgency, nothing's going to get in my way, but don't neglect self-care. Take care of yourself, which includes getting enough sleep. Don't be working late. Get enough sleep. Get some exercise. And don't let work get in the way of your exercise. Eat healthy. Whatever you, healthy means to you. Avoid fast food. It's poison. It's good. But it's poison. And it does not help your mental health. It does not help your focus. It's empty calories. Eat good food. Eat real food. Because self-care, taking time off, establishing me time, getting your exercise in, getting out of the office to go to lunch, don't eat at your desk. That is essential for establishing improved focus and you managing your time better because you're fresher, you're clearer, you're sharper. And if you're fed well and you're rested well, you're that much better for not only yourself and your employer, but for the people who report to you. I'll get off that one. Don't overcommit. It's one of my worst habits. It's one that I've struggled with for years is overcommitting because I'm a people pleaser. I want people to like me. So I say yes way too often to help people out. I like to help people. It's the core of what gives me self-satisfaction. And so I fight myself on this all the time, and I've never been perfect at it. I've gotten way better through the years. But watch your people pleasing. It's okay from time to time, as I said earlier, to say no to some things. Be realistic about your available time. 
and don't agree to take on more than you can handle. Do not allow your plate to get over full. Let whoever is shoveling all this onto you know that there's too much. And maybe you help them get some things off or reassigned or delayed, but don't overcommit. And don't be a perfectionist. If you're a super high C on the disc scale, you're a perfectionist. And this perfectionism goes against your grain, but it can also lead to wasted time. Paralysis by analysis might be an example of that. And so sometimes, very often, good, don't let good or great get in the way of good enough. I know you'd like to deliver great and perfect all the time, but listen, sometimes it's okay, if not most of the time, it's okay to be, it's good, it's good enough. Don't kill yourself on certain projects or expectations trying to make something perfect. You don't have to. Set a better, more achievable standard. It doesn't have to be perfect. Take that pressure off yourself. Another, don't ignore deadlines. <laughs> Keep track of deadlines. And make sure, again, back to time blocking, tasks. You know, I love checklists. I love daily routines. I like to write things down on a permanent document so I know all these things are going to get done today or this week. And that's going to help you complete your task on time. Create routines. And don't forget to plan. Plan your time in advance. Take, you know, and here's what I'm saying. At the end of the day, before tomorrow, plan tomorrow. At the end of the week on Friday afternoon, take the last hour or so to plan next week. And this is going to help you stay on track. If you're a salesperson, if you're a sales professional, there is, this is an essential vital behavior. You've got to plan your day, you've got to plan your week, and you need to do it ahead of time because I know you salespeople, you like to shoot from the hip. You like to spray and pray and you like to make it up as you go along. And that's fine. You may be very successful with that. You're going to be even better if you get good at planning. Plan who you're going to call. Plan what you're going to get done. Plan on the follow-up. Plan on the follow-through. Take the last 30 minutes to an hour every day, plan tomorrow, take a look at your list for tomorrow, plan it out, what's going to come first, put your high priority things on your calendar, schedule time to get it done. Best way possible, in my opinion. And at the end of the week, pat yourself on the back for all this, this focus you've been able to create and the things you've been able to accomplish. Look at next week. What's on my list? What am I carrying over from this week to next week? What days am I going to get that done? How long is it going to take me to get it? Let me plan it on my calendar, the high priority things. It's one of the greatest approaches to stay in focus you can possibly take. So let me wrap this deal up. Leading a team requires understanding of these best practices. And these best practices need to allow your employees the time, the resources, the best practices to stay engaged and productive. And if you want success, you have to create an environment where you allow this focus. You allow the best practices that create focus. You take into account all the distractions, all the curveballs that come at you. You take into account all the tasks at hand and plan for the distractions, but don't allow the distractions to pull you away from your high priority task. And you've got to support your ability and their ability to concentrate. And if you do that, friends, you're going to reap the re benefits, you're going to reap the rewards, you're going to feel better, more is going to get done. 
And this all I understand. I understand it's easier for Vaughn to sit here on the business mechanic show and say that, but I've lived it. I've done it. I know you can do it. Believe me. You know, and again, you know, this ain't bragging. It's the facts. I ran a $2 billion business with 3,000 employees and my stuff got done on time. My stuff got done on time. I didn't let people down because of what I'm sharing with you today. These are, these are the approaches that highly effective leaders use to manage your time. And when we're living in a world where attention spans are about seven seconds, that of a goldfish, part of that comes because of all these distractions and our poor time management habits, which erodes our focus. So hope you got benefit out of this. This is, this is also posted as a blog on our website, rdltraining.com. If you want to go, all these are listed in the blog. Visit RDL training, Romeo Delta Lima training.com. And for your personal development, look over some of our courses there. Pick one or two. And let's get started. And for productive time management, there are many habits that you need to reduce, if not eliminate, that are keeping you from effective time management skills. So I've talked about all those today. So thank you all very much. We'll We'll be looking forward to talking to you again next week. I appreciate all the support. The, the show is really blowing up and it gives me a lot of honor. And please check out our training courses. That's what keeps the lights on around here. And with that, we'll talk to you again real soon.